Hey, gum people. Gonna talk about gum people, not dumb people. Gonna talk about emergency vehicle driving. Shit, the basketball. Oh, I forgot to turn my thing. <laughs> Alright, did my treadmill. So, I'm gonna talk about contact patch, rolling friction. You probably can't read this, but you'll be able to read it in a minute. I'll zoom in. Contact patch, rolling friction, apex in the turn, braking and turning, understeer and oversteer, skid pad, a pit, forcing oversteer, a J turn, ABS, brakes. But first, we're gonna get why? Oh shit! <laughs> Stupid basketball. <laughs> why a basketball has to do with driving? And that's to show you. Wow. Kind of went way down there, didn't it? Did I change? Easy boy. Basketball. So, what a basketball does is this is considered a wheel or a rolling friction. A contact patch, which is the first thing I'm going to talk about here. A contact patch is the part of the basketball that's on my hand. If it was on a piece of wood or something flat, the contact patch is the part that's touching the wall. If I'm in sand or soft ground, I have a bigger contact patch. Sometimes I'll let the air out of a tire to get more traction in the mud because it gives you a, counter, uh, a better contact patch. If I overinflate a tire, I get less of a contact patch because it makes the tire rod tighter. So this is a normal contact patch. If I break, I get a bigger contact patch. So that's how I always like to go when I'm playing basketball. I'll go out there and go, hey, can I play? <laughs> All right, basketball. So, a contact patch changes with a lot of factors. We have weight, we have tire pressure. Um, again, on, on a, if this is your tire and you're overinflated, it causes your, your side to go up and it gives you a smaller contact patch. So this is flat part, I get the most contact patch, properly inflated tire. Overinflated, I have a smaller contact patch underinflated the car it kind of rolls on its edges so I lose the middle here and I have a smaller contact patch so keeping your tires inflated gives you the best contact patch now another thing that affects contact patch is the ground am I on concrete, am I on gravel, am I in sand is there water, is there um, I'm going to go rolling friction what about basketball rolling friction versus skidding So, rolling friction is the ball is rolling. Notice it's rolling. That's rolling. This is not rolling friction. I'm skidding. My tire or wheel is not spinning. It's sliding. When you, when you lose rolling friction from braking too hard, slamming on the brakes, hitting your emergency brake, and you cause your tires to slide, what happens is little ball bearings of rubber builds up. And it actually makes your ball, your car, your tire, like you're riding on ball bearings. So it makes you lose your steering, your braking, and your control. That's why you don't lock off your tires. That's why now without uh, anti-lock brakes, ABS, you don't have that problem. Now you can actually brake in a turn. It used to be if you were turning, you hit your brakes. Remember when I hit my brake, I get a better contact patch on the front because my weight shifts. So my contact patch on the front gets bigger. When I take off, my rear tires get bigger. I'm gonna show you that on a motorcycle right now. So, get out of the way, ball. Now I don't need you, you wanna come over here. So, stored in potential energy. A lot of people lose this in, in, in cars and things. Right now, my shocks because I've got weight in here and, and the motorcycle weight, my shocks are what's considered at a neutral. When I brake, that dipping motion compresses the front shocks or springs. That's known as stored or potential energy. And the reason it's stored energy is because it has to go somewhere. I'm compressing, it's stored, and then it's going to let go and it's going to pop back. So stored, release. Stored, release. Potential energy release. Okay, same thing if I back up. If I'm going, when I accelerate, if I pop a wheelie, my back one goes up and I lose the front. My front tire comes up. So when I, when you take off fast or you brake fast, you lose contact patch. Remember we talked about contact patch. 
pack. It changes, your contact pack changes depending on how your car is. So if this is my car and I'm driving and I brake, my car dips forward, causing the front springs to compress. That's stored of potential energy. When that's released, if I accelerate and those springs are pushing, it's going to cause me to lose traction. When I accelerate and your car kind of leans back, your back tire, you have stored compression in here. Your front springs expand, just like when you brake, your rear springs expand, your front ones compress. That stored in potential energy causes people to wipe out. They brake, their car's going like this, and then they try to turn and steer, and their contact patch has changed because here I have bigger contact on the front, very small in the rear. When I'm taking off, I have bigger contact in the rear, very small in the front. If I'm turning on a curve and, and the energy's forcing me out, it's going to lean like this. So I'm going to have bigger contact patches on the outside, smaller on the inside. Okay? And that's kind of where am I here? Apexing a turn. I got to stay on point because I kept uh, losing. So if I need to take this, this corner right here, and I'm driving along and I need to take this corner here, the quickest point between two, the shortest route between two points is a straight line. So the quickest point to here from here is a straight line. But the road goes this way. <coughs> but normally there's two lanes. So apexing a turn is basically I'm going to enter the turn high, I'm going to drop down low and come straight across, and then come out high. That will give me more speed. And when you're chasing, I've chased a lot of guys, and believe me, I gain down on them really quick because I apex. Race car drivers, apex a turn. People that don't understand cars don't apex a turn. You want to apex that turn. So, uh, braking and turning. It used to be a big issue because if I'm turning, I'm going straight. I hit my brakes. My front goes down, so I have bigger contact patches. I try to steer. Because I have small contact patches in the front, if I steer, my rear end whips around. That's called oversteer. I've oversteered what the vehicle do. Understeer is I'm coming in here and I brake hard, my wheels lock up, and I turn my wheels this way, but the car goes straight. Because I've lost that rolling friction, therefore my tires are locked up. I'm getting those little rubber ball bearings underneath it, and I go straight. Do the same thing as snow. You go snow, hit your brakes, turn your front wheel all the way to the left, and you're still going straight. You've lost rolling friction. It's harder to get rolling friction on slippery surfaces. So when it rains, if you hit oil, snow, ice, when you reduce speed, you increase the chance of maintaining rolling friction. When you increase speed, you increase the chance of losing rolling friction, and you get skids. And this is basic all... Uh, all cops go through this evac training. I used to teach this in academy. I think it's a four or six hour block, so you're getting a really condensed version, kind of like the things I think, you're not getting all the formulas and everything, but you're getting a kind of quick overturn. So I, I went over oversteer and understeer. And what happens if you want to go in a parking lot and practice this when it's raining or snowing, go in a parking lot, spin your back tires, floor it, your back tires will start spinning, or if you got a pickup truck, as your back tires are spinning, turn your wheel and you'll notice your rear end swings out. That's called oversteer. Okay? Understeer, you're going really fast and, and uh, you try to turn and your car continues to go straight. So you hit your brakes and your car goes straight and your wheels aren't moving. And you can go on YouTube and see all these vehicles where cars are sliding in ice. This thing looks crooked to me. There. Uh, so and you can tell all your videos in ice when cars are going down the road this way, their tires are pointing this way and they're going this way. And because they have no rolling friction. They have lost their rolling friction. And that's important to remember because you don't want to slam on your brakes. You don't want to hit your brakes when you have to steer because it throws your car into that potential and stored energy. De stretching these springs, compressing these springs, and then when you try to turn, your car is releasing all that energy and you lose control, you get a wobble, you wipe out. So that's, uh, that's understeer and oversteer. Let me get something here to do my uh, pit maneuver. A pit maneuver.
maneuver is basically, and I was going to draw this on the board, but it's just easier to kind of come up here and explain to you. So a pit maneuver is basically I'm going to force oversteer. If, if a car is coming this way, a cop's going to come up, I'm going to get my front wheel right to his rear wheel, and then I'm going to turn just like this and floor it. And when I do, I'm going to spin his tire. When a car is going straight and it suddenly turns sideways, the wheels kind of lock up and it'll jam the transmission. Sometimes it'll kill the engine. It'll usually stall and lock up the transmission, though. That will usually put the car out of commission for a second unless they get it restored, etc. But if I come up here and try to push in the middle, I can't create this oversteer. So when we're training the pit maneuver and we're driving in our cars with the big rails and trying to get people to pit, we have to make sure you just want to come up almost bumper to bumper. And you just want to have enough to where you can push that and create that oversteer, which will swing the rear end around, cause the car to circle, maybe kill the engine. And that's a pit maneuver. If you want to know if a cop did a pit maneuver, watch you go watch on YouTube and watch these guys. If the cop pits the guy and ends up behind him, he didn't do it right. When you pit somebody, you come up and when you hit this wheel, when I turn, I turn hard and I floor my car. I want to drive my car through this guy and pass him as he's spinning. So when the cop car ends up in front of the spinning vehicle, he did a pit right. If he ends up behind it or next to it, he did it wrong. Even though it worked, he did it wrong. Because the right way to do a pit is I want to spin this car out and be past him, and then he should spin out, and then one of the other cars behind him should stop him. Uh, a J turn, uh, they used to teach us, I don't know uh, if they still do. If I'm going down a roadway and a bad guy passes me this way and I want to turn around, the quickest way to turn around is to use my emergency brakes because your emergency brake are not ABS. When you hit your emergency brake, it locks up your tire. What does locking up the tire do? Creates no rolling friction. Your back tires stop spinning. They skid. They get these rubbers. So they lose traction. If you do this in a control, it can help you. So I'm coming down. I see a bad guy go this way. I hit my emergency brake. My car skids. I turn my front wheel because I still have traction. All my weight's shifting forward. I got big contact patches. I steer to the left because I have no rolling friction. My tire just kind of spins around. I take my emergency brake off and I take off behind the guy. And that's called a J-turn. You can practice those in a parking lot. We used to do them in, in the skid pans or uh, what they would do is they, they would spray oil and water on a flat, really smooth concrete. We'd go out there with tires that are bald on these cars and we would just drive 20 miles an hour skidding. And it, and it teaches you because when you get understeer or oversteer, they tell you you need to turn in. When you get oversteer to where you've turned and you've lost control of the rear, you always turn to the spin. So if I'm coming this way and my tires are this way and I'm trying to turn and I feel my rear end slipping and I'm losing it, my tires should go this way. I will drive with the skid and straighten out the car. Most people, if you turn this way, your car starts spinning and you don't straighten up, then you just go into a really loop real quick. So you have to practice this and that's what a skid pad does. When we're riding around a skid pad at 20 miles an hour, we're swinging our rear end this way, we're going with the turn, we're swinging it back the other way, going with the turn, we're swinging it back the other way, going with the turn, and that just helps you control your car and learn how to steer. It reinforces that muscle memory. When I lose my rear end, I want to make sure and steer into, the into my skid and not away from it because that will put me in a spin and you get into centrifugal and uh, other forces. So, I try to cover a lot of these quickly. Uh, I don't know what my time is. I need something to drink. This is a pretty big topic, but not having the fundamentals of understanding what a car does and all the momentums and energy and transfer of weight and that dipping and the contact patches and why it's important to keep your tires properly inflated. I mean, when I was working on that, and I knew we were, you know, we getting four or five pursuits a night chasing stolen cars, I always check my tires because the last thing I want to do is be out there with a low tire or flat tire. I'm chasing some dude and it's going to cause me to wipe out. I'm going to misjudge a turn. I'm going to try an apex at a high speed. My tire is going to blow, roll, etc. So tires are pretty important and most cop cars, they change the tires pretty regularly because they want you to have good rubber for driving, you know, with the speeds, braking, etc. But when you're in an undercover car and you're no, you're going to be chasing people. You, you want to make sure your tires are properly inflated. So, I mean, I still check my tires. It becomes habit. Uh, I look at my tires. I do my little inspection. 
When I go to the gas station, I always clean my headlights off. Everybody's always look at me. I never just clean my windshield. I clean my brake lights and my headlights always. Because in a cop car, I want to make sure people saw me when I hit my brakes in case I was chasing the money, or I want my headlights to give me the best visibility. And most people don't clean their headlights and taillights, and I always clean mine on my personal car, and I always did it on my police car, because I want to make sure they see me, and I want to see as much as I can see. Because we're working a lot of times at night, low dark areas, we chase, there's no lights, we go from light to darkness, it's hard to see. So, hopefully understanding all that, I can zoom in on that little thing there, so in case you want to read it. Remember, the contact patch you, uh, changes when you get different surfaces and you get stored of potential energy from either braking or accelerating or making a turn and your car shifts. When your car shifts and weight shifts, that's when you're going to get that stored potential energy. And if you react and turn with that energy releasing and they work together and all the stars align up, you're going to crash. Uh, and then we have rolling friction. Remember, you don't want to lock it up. You want to make sure and maintain rolling friction. You don't want to skid. Apexing the turn, straight line. You enter a turn high and you drop low. I never stay in my lane when I'm trying to make a turn fast. If I'm in a turn, I'm entering in my lane high if it's a left turn and I'm dropping into the oncoming lane so I can get as low as I can to shoot straight out of that turn. Um, Braking and turning is bad because you have all that weight shift, contact patch, etc. Oversteer and understeer we talked about. The pit, basically you're forcing a little bit of oversteer. J-turns, we talked about that. ABS brakes, which ends up forcing that rolling friction so you don't lose rolling friction. Okay, so uh, hopefully that my, my basketball skills explain that perfectly. And uh, <laughs> Moki's inside the house. He didn't want to come out. It's really windy and <laughs> kind of crappy out here. But uh, anyway, that's my spiel on emergency driving, understanding a car. The more you understand about the car, the better you're going to be able to handle things when they happen. The more you practice it in the snow, rain, skid pad, etc. When it happens, you won't be surprised. You'll be like, I've been through this before. I've, I've seen my rear end go out. I've, I've know what over, oversteer is and understeer. I understand when I lose rolling friction. I understand when I'm in a curve. If I floor it, when my stored or potential energy is releasing itself, it's going to send me into a spin or possibly cause me to start wobbling or go into a spin. So you need to just be aware of your car. You don't want to make very abrupt left and right turns. You don't want to make abrupt braking. And you don't want to change speed or brake in a turn because you've already got forces on your car as you're turning. And then you end up braking or accelerating. Now you increase those forces dramatically. And again, that's how you lose traction. You lose your rolling friction. You get oversteer and steer. All right, so we'll end that there on um, emergency driving or vehicle driving, hopefully uh, the dynamics, and now you can say you went through the police academy on emergency driving. No, you can't, you big dummy. Somebody be like, well, I took emergency driving from Rick on YouTube, and I'm an expert. Go out there and crash your damn car like a dummy. All right, we'll end that there.